This is Tyrese Halliburton, and you're listening to Setting the Pace. Pacer Nation, what is going on? Welcome back to another episode here of your go-to Pacers podcast. And the Indiana Pacers get a huge win over the Oklahoma City Thunder, 126-112. Take care of business at home. Here to talk to me about this game, you guys know him as the curse, but he's also the president of the Jermaine O'Neal Fan Club. We'll give him some positive love today. Michael J. Fachi coming off a win. You know, there was a curse broken tonight, but it wasn't yours. It was not mine. And in this uh, this t- town, a.k.a. this country, I guess, it's not big enough for two curses. So, <laughs> hey, shout out to Owen, breaking yours. I'm next one of these days. But for today, we are recapping a win. It feels good to get back on winning track. I don't care who the Thunder were without. No SGA, no Jalen Williams. This was a must win for the Pacers. I was worried early on, but they handled business in the end. Absolutely, Flatch. I mean, it was a it was a weird game, but they were able to kind of pull away there in the third. Then the Thunder came back, and then they were able to pull away in the fourth. And so, you know, not the greatest defensive performance we've seen from this Pacers team, and that is a little bit concerning. But we do need to talk about the guy that is the franchise, Tyrese Halliburton. An incredible honor for him last night. Not only does he break Mark Jackson's record by picking up his 11 assists that he needed. So he got assist 714, a pass to Aaron Neesmith for a three. He he locks that in. He's probably going to, you know, shatter that record in years to come if he plays more than 65 games. But speaking of 65 games, he reaches the threshold to make all NBA. So Tyrese Halliburton does qualify for all NBA after that game last night against the Thunder. So, you know, just congratulations, Tyrese Halliburton, on accomplishing everything. Oh, absolutely. This is a, a record that we felt that he would have broke last year if he could have stayed healthy. And honestly, it feels like a mark that he could surpass every single year if yeah. he stays healthy. I think when you asked Tyrese about this question, you know, a couple nights ago, he said he would hope to have, you know, numerous spots on like the top 10 list for the Pacers. So I think he very well will. But yeah, great to A, get that franchise single season assist record, hit the 65 game threshold. At this point, there is no time to rest. Things are way too tight in the standings. But for Tyrese, it's got to be a load off of his shoulders, hitting that that threshold. A lot of money at stake for Tyrese. I know his play has dipped, but I do feel that he really put in that work early on in the season that now at this point, he's not a lock for all NBA, but he absolutely should have some very, very strong consideration. And I think after everything we and Tyrese has been through, you hope he makes all NBA so it all paid off. There's a handful of guys, too, that won't be eligible to make it either, which yep. does help his case. So that's, you know, that's part of the rules, the stipulations. You got to play so many games, and Tyrese did meet that threshold, which I know there were some rough moments there with him trying to reach that threshold just because he was trying to ease back into things with that hamstring injury. But it is a, it's definitely a blessing for him to get that. But you're right, Tyrese Halliburton, what he said to me when I asked him, like, what would it mean to break this record when it comes – you know, he he said, you know what? He said, I I want to be, you know, one through 15 when it Love comes it. to, you know, assist most assists in the season for the Pacers and have him have like the top 15. And that to me says a lot of things because it only, it means that number one, he's committed to the franchise. Long time. Yeah. And it means that he thinks he can have a long and, and prosperous career because like 15 seasons, that's a long time. I mean, you're talking about this will be the only one he has right now. So we'd have to do it 14 more times after this. So you know, that's that's going to be hard to do. I would be really interested to see if there's some way he can eventually pass John Stockton's all-time record for most assists in a season. And I and I think it's he averaged like 14 assists a game, around 1,100 assists in a season. That's pretty insane to do. But I think if there's any person in the league that can do it right now, it is Tyrese Halliburton. And here's the thing with that, though. John Stockton never missed games. Right. This is a man that played 82 games a lot. So it's one of those records that's going to be really, really hard to beat. And it becomes even more impressive when you think about when Stockton did that and the amount of fewer possessions that there were back in the 90s. Mm-hmm. So I feel like compared to now, there's obviously a lot more possessions. But, hey, anything's possible. I think that would have to mean that Tyrese would have to have a lengthy career. That's what you hope for. You have to stay healthy. That is what you hope for. And if he can do that in a Pacers uniform, that's the best part of all. So, yeah, if the Pacers were able to get, say, 15 seasons out of Tyrese, like he said, he's going to be one of the all-time franchise greats and have his number in those rafters. And I think at that point, it shouldn't have to come down to a championship or not. 
this man's obviously a special talent and a career like that, that long in Indiana, that would be something special. Yeah, it, it's really interesting to look at John Stockton's numbers here. I'm sorry, I'm going back to this just because it was really interesting to me. But he's number one, number two, number three, number four, number six, number eight, and number nine on the all-time assist in a season. Uh, and all those are over 1,000. So that's that's pretty impressive. I mean, John Stockton was was terrific. The only person that cracked the top five that wasn't John Stockton was former Pacers coach Isaiah Thomas. So I think that that's pretty interesting stuff. But Tyrus Halliburton, you know, if he can stay healthy, like we've talked about the last two years, if he can stay healthy, like he's going to shatter some records. And yes. it'd be interesting to see if he would have played like, what, 15, 17 more games. I don't know what he'll end up finishing. I think maybe 14 games is where he's at now that he's missed. But if he can finish the season with that many games, like that's pretty that's pretty spectacular. But, you know, I thought in this game Tyrese wasn't great offensively, had some had some shots there. But Rick Carlisle did make a great point and and how much attention they were focusing on him. And they had Lou Dort like just shadowing him the whole game. It was just like they were, you know, they were hell bent on making sure that Tyrese Halliburton did not get going. But that's why I think that Tyrese Halliburton is so important to this team because he draws so much attention and it allows for other guys to get going or, you know, for things to change up a little bit when maybe he's not in the game because there's so much attention to stopping him. It's the same thing kind of in football where it's like a guy like. Aaron Donald might be drawing double and triple teams. Maybe it's hard for him to come up with some killer stats, but the amount of, um, you know, the ability for him to open it up for his teammates becomes huge. And I think that with Tyrese Halliburton, those 11 assists that he had, it's massive. And I started to do the math as like, where is this team when Tyrese is below eight assists? They're two and nine on the season when he's below eight assists. So he is that engine. And at times, of course, you would love for him to be, giving you 20 to 25 points on any given night. But if he's drawing a lot of attention and he's able to get his teammates going and his teammates can can make uh, you know make the, the posting defense pay for it, that's great. That's great for the Pacers. I just think that this Pacers team is better when Tyrese, you know, is uh, – they're a lot worse when he's in those five, six assists, seven assists. It's just not Pacer basketball. And, yes, he only had eight points. Five of them came in the final minute and 30 seconds of the third where he hit a, you know, it was, it was a big basket. Then that, that three pointer at the buzzer. Uh, I think that was a great momentum shift to go into the fourth and really put uh, OKC in the back burner. I think that, that gave the Pacers an 11 point lead at that time. And that was, uh, they never really had to look back. Yeah. He had two big threes in that quarter. Right. And like that one that he hit at the end of the third was so special. And then from the video angle that I saw on the, on the big screen at the game last night, when he was coming out of the crowd, I looked over at Tyler Smith and I said, doesn't he kind of look like Danny Granger here? And he said, yeah, a little bit from that angle. It was just a certain angle that they had. And I thought, man, that's kind of funny that, you know, that that reminded me of that. But it's just great to see Tyrese hit that big shot. But he also had one when the score was like a two-point game. And he hit a three to make it a five-point game earlier in that third quarter because they were struggling to get some offense going. And I think it was because of the defensive pressure they were putting on Tyrese. You know, the starters didn't have a great night overall in terms of like their plus minus together, but they figured things out. But I, I will just say this. It was, it was a interesting game for Tyrese because zero points at half, like, you know, that's just weird. You're not used to seeing that, but no. still had eight assists at half. So it's one of those things where he can still impact the game and his scoring is kind of one of those things where we've wanted him to become more of a scorer. But I think now with Pascal Siakam on this team, it does kind of take some of that scoring load off, but I don't necessarily think that's the case come playoff time. I think he's going to have to be around an 18 to 20 points per game score if this team wants to have success. Nothing is more true than that. The Pacers are not winning playoff games if Halliburton's having eight points. I mean, I had a friend text me yesterday and goes, eight points for Halliburton? And I was like, we won. We won. Like, relax. Like, it's like, what, what, can, what can you say? It's, it's not – a performance that you could go to bat and say, oh, well, no, but he was great. He was this, that, that. The 11 assists, it goes a long way. But, like, come playoff time, you need Tyrese Halliburton to be the guy that he was in November, December, and January. And I just feel that you're going to need to get, yeah, like you said, 18 points. That kind of feels like the floor for, for what you need for Tyrese to be able to, you know, go against the elite competition of the Eastern Conference. I mean, this was a Thunder team that was without SGA, without Jalen Williams. Chet Holmgren had three fouls in the first quarter. So I felt like you're going to see some better defense, um, you know, in the playoffs. And Tyrese Halliburton will have to be better. But on a night like tonight, it's uh, last night, it's great that we got that win and don't have to worry about how many points he scored. 
For sure. And I, and I think part of the reason why he didn't have to worry about it as much is because of the guy that backs him up. And that is exactly. TJ McConnell. TJ McConnell was absolutely sensational in this game. And it felt like the Pacers kind of got off to a slow start. And here comes TJ McConnell once again, bringing the energy to the game and, and really just changing things. Once again, the Pacers going a 25 to five run in that first or second quarter. What were your thoughts on that? That all bench unit. I mean, they were massive in the first quarter. There was a time where things looked ugly. OKC is up 10 in the first quarter, and you're like, how? I mean, they're without arguably their two best players, at least two of their top three by by every means. And that all bench unit just caught fire. They kept they they really, you know, Obi Top and hit a big shot, you know, to to really end the, the first. McConnell was was amazing. I just felt the bench in this game, this was one of those performances of where you can see why the Pacers bench unit leads the NBA in points with just over 46 points per game. It's 61 in this game. Mm -hmm. McConnell, right now, I think we're witnessing the best and most consistent play of his career. There's times where he's had bigger games, but in terms of translating to winning, I think this is the best TJ McConnell that the league has seen. It might not be 10 steal, triple double McConnell or that incredible performance against the Bucks, but the uh, a while back, but the consistency has been there. 16 points, 10 assists. He always does it in about just 20 minutes of play. I I, I thought McConnell on the bench was incredible last night. Yeah, and don't forget the five rebounds. Like that's a good amount of yeah. rebounds for McConnell, right? So, and yeah. in this game, he was the third re- the hard, third highest rebounder in this game. I mean, it says a lot. Yeah, no, I mean, honestly, like we undersold the importance of McConnell. I know at the beginning exactly. of the year we were trying to figure out like you're going to leave McConnell out of the rotation, and it was, it was a weird conversation. People were not loving that conversation, but <laughs> hey, you know what? That's what the that's what the coaching staff thought early on too. Like. You know, Nimhart's probably a better overall player. Like, we got to leave McConnell out. But no, like, McConnell's turned things around. We, we've we talked a lot about McConnell in the past couple of weeks, just oh, yeah. giving him a lot of Certainly praise. But so. still, it's deserved. But it's also one of those things where you really can't adequately express what he means to this team. I'm not saying he's the MVP or anything like that. But the way that he just brings so much in terms of energy, you know, efficient play, getting guys involved, um, I love how Jalen Smith has been crashing interviews. We've been mm-hmm. we talked to Jeremiah Johnson about this, but he crashed the interview last night when they were when JJ was uh, interviewing TJ, and he just said, "You know what? The only reason our bench was so great is because of TJ McConnell." He was like, "He's coming in there, and when he's just scoring the ball." He said, "He's not a passer anymore. He's just a scorer." But I, I guess Jalen forgot he did have ten assists too. But yes. still, he said he's getting older. We know it's not going to last forever. He's got to do this. Love Obviously it. joking around with him being the old mm-hmm. man on the team or one of the older guys on the team. But I just I can't express enough like what TJ McConnell brings. It's like every time the Pacers get off to a slow start, I'm wondering how early Rick Carlisle is going to go to TJ McConnell, just knowing that he needs someone to get in there and bring in the energy. And that to me is something that McConnell talked about was they've got to mature as a team. And, and he talked about how bad that Nets loss was on the road and how they, you know, they learn from it. They know what what's at stake obviously, but like they have to be a mature team about that. And I just feel like McConnell plays with a maturity in every single game that, you know, there is no, I'm going to take a night off because we're playing a, a lesser team. TJ McConnell only knows how to play one way. That's true. And it's, we've always said it's infectious. And when you see him going as hard as he goes, and it, it just, how could you not get that extra motivation to go a little bit harder? His plus 22 led the Pacers last night. And, you know, and then people started talking about, you know, why isn't McConnell game, getting more recognition for potential sixth man of the year? Look, look, he's not going to win it, but he deserves to at least have his name tossed around. I started to look at who are the other candidates. You got Malik Monk, Nas Reed, Norman Powell. Uh, th- those were uh, some of the top candidates. That, there's one other guy that I'm forgetting right now. But uh, regardless, I, I felt that oh, Bobby Portis was the other one. Those are the top four in terms of betting odds. But I feel that T.J. McConnell has been awesome. Some of those guys might be putting up bigger stats, but they're also um, a lot bigger players in stature. Guys that have had bigger roles, playing more minutes. McConnell's doing all this having a career year in about 20 minutes of play. That's actually less. Um, and I think that what you see on an every given night is right now, if you took T.J. McConnell off of this bench unit, 
it crumbles. It really does with no Benedict Matherin and all the other changes that they've made throughout the year. You know, you're not having your the same depth you had with Bruce Brown and Buddy Heal at the guard spots. What TJ McConnell is doing is incredibly essential to this Pacers team. And uh, I just don't know where they would be without him. Yeah, I will say this, and, and it's not like I'm trying to, to knock on anybody, but TJ McConnell's scoring uptick and the way he's played so well has kind of made you forget a little bit about Benedict Matherin. It, it's it, not it really something has. that you, you're not hearing people say like, oh, if we had Matherin, we win this game, though. No one's really been saying that recently. It's mostly just At all. like, yeah, it's like other guys are stepping up, and I think part of it's out of sight, out of mind, because Matherin's not been with the team right now. As he's re, you know in rehab, and I haven't seen him on the – at least I haven't seen him on the bench or anything like that, so – you know, I think yeah. that's part of it. But, you know, I, I want to go back to, you know, you start, we talked about the slow start this team got off to because at first they went to Pascal Siakam like three of the first four possessions and he kind of got things going. But it was like a seven to four Pacers lead. And then the Thunder went on an 18 to six run. They were up 22 to 13. And that's when McConnell and them came into the game. Now, obviously, it didn't happen right away. But slowly there, the Pacers had a 25 to five run with that bench unit mostly. And it just speaks volumes to like how good this bench can be. We we know that benches usually don't have the same amount of impact in a playoff setting as mm -hmm. they do in a regular season setting. So I do think that is a bit problematic. But I also think that the bench has been such a strength for the Pacers this year that hopefully these guys that have been able to play in bigger moments are ready for the playoffs when that time comes. I would really like to think so. Like in the past, we've we've worried like, okay, but look, what's a TJ McConnell going to deliver in the playoffs? I don't have that mentality now. The way that McConnell's playing, I do feel that he's going to deliver in the playoffs. So I'm excited about that. Obi Toppin's that guy that that you're. He's kind of like that X factor right now. I mean, the play that he gave the Pacers last night. If he can give you that in the playoffs, it's going to be incredible. Um, then you look at guys like Jalen Smith. I mean, Jalen Smith has moments. Jalen Smith only played 13 minutes. His 12 points at a halftime tied Miles Turner with the lead for the team. He didn't score in the second half, but it's like he was huge in that first half of just getting the Pacers off to where they needed to be. You know, mm -hmm. then there's guys like Isaiah Jackson you don't expect to see come playoff time, but I just feel like, you know, like a Doug McDermott, probably not going to see him too much. He, he, he played well. I mean, look, two of three from three. Anytime you're getting that type of a play from McDermott, you can Gotta love it. And then Ben Shepard, while he struggled from the field, nearly got to double-digit scoring. Pacers are undefeated yeah. when he gets to double digits. So I was kind of looking at that to be like, can we get him two more? Could we, could we keep that stat alive? Could we beef it up? But it's um, a night like, like last night really just showed how good this bench is. And after all the hits that they've taken, and going back to your point about uh, Matherin, I had a friend who he knows a little bit about basketball. We're not going to say he's like a diehard fan. He's like, you guys are ever, ever since you lost math and I mean, it's over for you guys. Like, I was like, mm, not, not really. Like, uh, like he's a good player, but it's not like it was like, there's a, there's a ton of other guys. The Pacers could have unfortunately lost. And that would have been a way bigger impact. We've mm -hmm. seen that this team, while they've taken some stumbles and at times, maybe you wish you had a math out there for a couple extra baskets They're They've really come together. I think the bench unit has really, really everybody kind of has that identity. They know what their role is. And I think they've played it well lately. And I think that against OKC, the bench saved the day. Well, let's go ahead and, and take a break, Faji, and talk about unified health. We go ahead and give us that read. Whether you're a world class athlete or a podcaster like your boy Foch, we all understand the importance of mental and physical well being and proper recovery. For top-notch performance. Whether you were Tyrese Halliburton dealing with a hamstring injury that took time to get back to normal, this is why I'm excited that Unified Healing is sponsoring this episode of Setting the Pace. Unified Healing is a new and super innovative global network of wellness centers powered by Energy Enhancement System, or as we like to call it, EE System. If you haven't heard of the EE system yet, you're going to want to listen up. This technology promotes wellness, deep relaxation, purification, and rejuvenation. Whether you're in the United States or Canada, it doesn't matter. There's hundreds of other locations across the globe. Access to a center is easy and affordable. How much cash you got on you? Oh, doesn't matter. I bet you could afford unified healing and what the ee system is bringing to the table now if you're interested in experiencing the ee system technology for yourself 
go to unifiedhealing.com slash pace to learn more and find a center near you. That is U-N-I-F-Y-D healing.com slash pace. No material or testimonials on the Unified Healing website are intended to be viewed as medical advice or a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Always seek the advice of your physician or other qualified healthcare providers with any questions you may have regarding a medical condition or treatment and before undertaking a new healthcare regimen, including the EE system. All right, Bachi. Well, let's keep it moving here because I think another important thing after we just talked about the unified healing and getting guys back on track, Miles Turner returned from injury to play in this game tonight. And I think some people early on were a little bit concerned because he did miss some shots right around the rim, but his jump shot looked pretty fluid. It was like he had his finger taped to another finger. So I'm sure it's an adjustment period for him, but I'm curious, what were your overall thoughts on his performance last night and how he played? Great to have him back. I think the Pacers obviously needed some size in this game. Anytime you're going up against a Chet Holmgren, you know, you, you want as much size as you, as you, uh, you can. And I think that Turner, when you look at it from the perspective of, you know, he played you know roughly 17 to 18 minutes. He scored 16 points in those 18 minutes. He played only about, what, like 10 seconds? In the, in the fourth quarter, didn't really play much there, but um, his 12 points led the Pacers at halftime, tied with Jalen Smith. The shot, like you said, I was worried about it. What's it going to be like? Is, is he going to go, if Turner went 0 for 3 or 0 for 4 from 3, even if it's just one game, I would have been nervous to be like, oh man, this is going to linger. But he goes 2 of 3 from 3. I think that was really encouraging to see. And the Pacers, I think, were able to keep him fresh by only playing about 18 minutes, no setbacks. Great to have Turner back out there, especially when you pick up a win. Yeah, I was I was very interested to see what a shot looked like during pregame warmup. So when I got there early, I was watching him shoot, and honestly, it, it didn't look like he was missing a beat in terms of his rhythm and things like that. You know, Miles has such a great shot, and he has such a soft touch on the basketball. So I, I definitely was not super concerned, but I was kind of wondering like how will this finger impact his shooting overall, but. Since it was just a dislocation, they got it reset, and it's just like a matter of time before it gets healed. It's a pain tolerance type of injury, as Rick Carlisle alluded to. So I, I really do think that things will be okay for him. The only thing is you just don't want him to re-injure it, but he did get a block shot in the game, so that didn't affect it as well. Shot his free throws right-handed, wasn't shooting left-handed free throws. So, you know, it's not one of those things where it's really uh, that problematic. But for him to only miss one game um, against Brooklyn, a game that you probably should have won even without him, it, it's good to have him back. I think that, you know, if anything happens, I'm sure he might get hit on the hand somehow trying to go for a rebound and someone slapping at the ball or something like that. Like that could be painful, things like that. But overall, hopefully he can just kind of maintain that tolerance to a, to a level that it doesn't hurt too bad and play through it because, you know, they need him out there on the floor. And you saw Jalen Smith go down with a, a small ankle injury in the third quarter. They had to call a timeout to put Isaiah Jackson. And it is nice to have, the luxury of three quality centers on your team, but nobody is in the same tier as Miles Turner in terms of talent. So they definitely need to have him healthy. And I think that this game proved, okay, he should be good to go for the rest of the season. Yeah. And that's, that's definitely just, you, you need Turner out there. I just think that, yeah, that one game sample size, the fact that they lost against Brooklyn, it just shows, all right, you know what, if Turner can play, we need him out there. Um, I don't know if he's being a, a little bit cautious, maybe just an off rebounding night, just three rebounds last night. I mean, it's not that you need to see him get 10 or 12 or anything like that, but I think uh, better rebounding days are ahead. But for what the shot looked like, to me, that's what I was looking at mm -hmm. is like if the shot looked rough and Turner all of a sudden is going to go, you know, kind of uh, into a little, little bit of a shooting slump, then I would have been very worried. But I saw enough last night to be like, okay, everything seems to be all, all right. Great. We're moving forward. How do we try and just – not make that injury any worse, anything of the sort. And I think that you only have a handful of games to get through before you get to the playoffs, but to just miss one game, it could have been way worse. Yeah, for sure. I mean, uh, honestly, I was not really sure what my level of concern was for this injury because the finger did look pretty nasty, but the way that, you know, this is one of those things where you have to play through pain and that's why they're getting paid the big bucks and, you know, why they're, why they're professionals because they're really good at what they do even when they're not 100%. So uh, we, we've seen how that's kind of impacted Tyrese Halliburton all year long. And 
I'm sure there's been other guys that have been injured. Ben Matherin, I think he was suffering through injuries for quite a while, and Rick mm-hmm. Carlisle said he just plays through everything. So it it does go to show you how much guy, how much you know pain these guys can tolerate while they're going through things. So you know you want everybody to be at their full health, but that's just not realistic in an 82 game season. So you're gonna have nicks and you know dings and bruises and things like that throughout the year. But hopefully Turner is back, Fachi, because I, I think that these next couple of games are gonna be huge. But I will say this, you talked about that fourth quarter. He only played about 10 seconds. He gets checked into the game. The the Thunder decided to go small, and then Rick Carlisle counters that by saying, all right, Miles, we're going to pull you out. We're going to go to Obi Toppin here with Pascal Siakam as the two bigs. And so, you know, I, I thought both of these guys had individually good games, Pascal and Obi. Mm-hmm. I, I also like the way they played together, and I asked Rick Carlisle about this after the game to kind of get his thoughts, but I was curious, what did you think about – that pairing together and maybe just how they played individually. I liked it. I mean, look, the pairing together, I think, yeah, you do have that versatility. It was a great question you asked, Carlisle. I think that when you look at the length uh, of those guys and the size, where would this Pacers team be without Siakam's size and his versatility? Because earlier in the year, it's like they were very, very limited on what they could do. And I feel that Siakam just gives them um, so much – you know, uh, you know, I guess I'll say versatility again, whatever you whatever you want to call it, that ability to play numerous positions. So together, thought it was good. Individually, I also thought they brought it. I mean, Obi mm-hmm. Toppin played one of his better games, I feel, in a while. Uh, the 15 points, eight boards is great. I mean, Siakam was uh, incredibly efficient, eight of 10 from the field. I, I think that both guys individually, very vital to the team together. I thought they were really good as well. Yeah, I mean, Pascal got things going early. Like, he was cooking Gordon Mm -hmm. Hayward. And I was a little surprised because I felt like the Pacers went away from that. And that's one thing that we've talked about is they had something working, and they went to it, like, I think three or four possessions in a row. I think they tried going to it, like, a a fourth or fifth time. And he tried running, like, a dribble handoff situation with Tyrese, and it led to a Miles Turner three. And I think he might have missed it. But uh, I know Siakam had... Two buckets early on, then he had a drive where he kicked it to Aaron Eastman in the corner, and I was like, okay, why are we going away from this? Because it doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Like, if it's working, keep going back to the well, right? Just keep going until it doesn't work. And the Pacers' offense was being so efficient at that point, and Hayward really just could not match up speed-wise or craftiness-wise. <laughs> no, with Pascal. He actually left the game with a leg injury did not return. So that was also something that I think hurt them a little bit in the second half, just being down another person. Uh, since they were already so shorthanded. But I will just say, like, you know, they they ended up putting a little more attention to Pascal in the post. They're, like, double-teaming and things like that. But I trust Pascal with his ability to pass out of the post. If he does get double-teamed, you know, there's going to be a guy open for a shot. So um, wasn't really sure why they got away from that, but maybe it was the Thunder's defensive adjustments a little bit. I know they went into a kind of a weird 3-2 zone type thing where they'd switch things and go kind of like a zone matchup type thing. So it was very different for them. But, you know, speaking of Obi Top and Fachi, one thing – I I think we talked about this. I can't remember, but uh, I know I talked about it with Combo a little bit. He's had more blocks recently in some of these games, and there was a a jump shot that he blocked in this game last night. I think it was in the late third, early fourth, something around that time frame. But you know, one of the things to me that Obi Toppin has done so well is is just you know find that right spot for him in his role because it's changed all season long. He hasn't complained. He's been healthy for every single game. He goes out there and is becoming more and more consistent. I think that's the one thing that I've liked about Toppin's game the last probably 10 to 15 games is he's become more and more consistent, more reliable. And I think he feels more of a, of a pressure in a sense to kind of step up and be more offensively minded with Matherin out and kind of being utilized more as an offensive threat with that second unit. So I will just say this. I've really enjoyed what we've seen from Obi Toppin the last couple of weeks, but specifically in this game, I thought he was very, very big. The last three games, he scored 15 points, 14 points, and 14 points. Yeah. That's the most consistent that OB has been, honestly, in a few months. I feel like that's that's kind of dating back to almost like pre-Pascal Siakam days where he had a little bit of a bigger role. The 25 minutes that he played in this game, uh, that's the most that he has played dating back to uh, – it was early. So it was dating back to January 26th against Phoenix. So it feels that Rick – Loved what he was doing, was rolling with him. And I think that over the last, uh, actually now it's five games in a row, he's seen more minutes now. It was 11 minutes against Chicago, 17 against the Lakers, 19 against Brooklyn, 20 minutes against Brooklyn, 25. So it feels that OB's playing good ball when you need him to. I know he was one of three from three-point land, but that shot's been looking good. 
It has been looking good. And the eight rebounds now, back-to-back games. I mean, that's why it's frustrating. Sometimes Obi has it. Sometimes he doesn't. But, like, you know he can rebound. He has the size. But on a night like last night, the eight rebounds leads the Pacers. And you need that. So I I think that we – you and I have talked about it. You can count on what McConnell is going to give you off the bench. Other than that, it's a little bit of a toss-up. Who's going to be that next guy? If you can get double-digit scoring and five or more rebounds out of Obi Toppin in the playoffs and just that hustle, I think that the Pacers are that much more of a dangerous team. Last night was an example of everything that Obi could be. And, yeah, to your point, his his role, his minutes, it's been inconsistent on this year. It's gone up and down, never once complained, has just been a class act, has worked hard, looks like he loves his teammates, couldn't really say any more great things about Obi this year, given you know the uh, the up and down of his role. Oh yeah, for sure, and I, and I think that's part of the reason why when we did our things, we're looking forward to seeing this month of April. Like I I talked about Obi Toppin and just kind of taking that step forward, and it's like they've played three games and then five days, I believe, since then. So he stepped up and really yeah. met that met that challenge, and honestly, like it's making me look like a smart guy because he's playing so well, but. I just wanted to see more from him because I feel like the efficiency has been there. You know, he's shooting the ball so well from two and from three, really just a, 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 probably his best season of his career and Definitely having an opportunity, you know, yep. having an opportunity now where he didn't have one in New York to kind of really showcase what he can do. Like I still think there's flaws to his game, but I was yeah. kind of curious what Rick Carlisle thought about that two man lineup. And I said, I did ask him a question. So I'm just going to read his quote. He said, I like that. It's an option when the other team goes small. They were behind 12 or 14. They went small to get into a driving kick mode, uh, you know, try to shoot three pointers and, and then trying to get to the free throw line. He said to have a big mobile or to have big mobile wings like Pascal and Obi really is a great option to have if needed. I like playing big as often as we can, but when they throw five guards out there, that's a different story. That's a lineup that helped us in that situation. So I, I think what Rick is really trying to get at here is like, I like playing big. There's a reason I remember him saying that after they put Jalen Smith into the starting lineup before acquiring Pascal, how they like playing bigger. We've seen times, not, not often, but we've seen more times when they've had Jairus play some three this year, which makes them bigger. But now you go away from Bruce and Ben Matherin. Uh, Bruce is a little bit smaller. Now you go knee Smith and, and Nimhart, who are both about six foot five, that, that does add more size to that starting lineup. You get Pascal Siakam in there, who's six foot nine. Turner, obviously, about seven foot. You, you you're able to throw out Obi Toppin, who's six foot nine, with that group as well. Um, at certain times, we've seen actually Pascal and Obi play with a center at points too, where Pascal's playing the three. So you know the size thing is important here, but the versatility that this team has now compared to what they look like in other years, they just didn't have it. The other, the only other versatility they had like three years ago was like O'Shea Brissett as a small ball five, and it's like. That just kind of shows way. you how far this team has come in terms of the talent that they've acquired. No, it, it's 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 totally true. And I, I definitely do feel like that was our option of like, well, yeah, I mean, look, you know, could, could have O'Shea be there. And it's like we just have so many more bodies now that can contribute. And it's great. And I'm looking at some of the minute breakdown. And Obi's actually played 12% of his minutes this year at center. That's something that he had really not done historically last Last year, he played 100% of his minutes at power forward. So it's great to see a little bit of versatility there. And then for Pascal Siakam, per basketball reference, he's actually played 10% of his minutes as the small forward on this team. Uh, With Toronto earlier this year, just 1% of his minutes as small forward. So it's great to see a little bit of that. He's even played 1% at center. Like you mentioned, hey, they've been able to have that versatility. I know 1% doesn't really feel like anything, but it's good to be able to have him just – being able to play multiple positions, and I think that uh, earlier in the year, the Pacers just didn't have those type of options. You, you, I know a guy like Bruce Brown could play multiple positions, but you don't want to play him at the four. You know, and I felt mm-hmm. the Pacers had those like, well, well you can play Jalen there or maybe a little bit of Bruce or this. It's just so much of a better fit with a guy like Pascal Siakam. So it's great to see. I think it, it gives the Pacers options, and I think that that's really important to be able to match different lineups. And uh, I thought that last night it was something that was effective. All right, let's go ahead and move on here, Fachi. I, I want to just give this opportunity now for you to talk about anybody maybe in this game that we did not highlight that you'd like to highlight. I thought Aaron Eastmith had a good game, 17 points. I think that that's, uh, that's something that was great to see. We've talked about he's he's had a little bit of struggles, four of seven from three. 
I mean, that's the Aaron Neesmith we saw in the beginning of the year. So great to see. But plus also, you know, he knocks down a three pointer that gives Hal Burton the record. I mean, it was just good to good to see that. But the 17 points, uh, I'm looking at it right now, Alex. That's the highest that he's had dating back to February 12th. Wow. Uh, that actually came in a loss against Charlotte. So I think that it was great to see Aaron kind of get back to um, the guy that everybody knows he could be. You don't need 17 points every night. But I think that that was good. And then just overall, I mean, my shout out is just, I think, just to the bench period. It was just so good. Every player off the bench was a minimum plus six. Isaiah Jackson was plus six. Everybody else was a minimum plus 11 in this game off the bench. So I think that that was really a um, a big uh, shining spot for this Pacers team. Just to touch on Neesmith real quick, like great efficient night for him offensively. Mm-hmm. I felt like defensively was not one of his better nights. Got in no. foul trouble early on, really struggled defensively um, to stay out of foul trouble. And that meant Ben Shepard had to play more minutes because Ben Shepard played 23 minutes, Neesmith played 25. So those two are basically filling in the three spot there for the Pacers if you look at the overall minutes played. But yeah, I mean, Aaron Neesmith, they need him to get going again. They need him to be more efficient because he can really do things. I will say this, Jalen Smith had a pretty good game as well. You know, 12 points, six rebounds. At one point, he was a leading score for this team in the second yep. quarter. Uh, had some nice moments. He had a dunk that gave them that 25 to 5 run. That was just such a great pass from McConnell. But I will say this a three point shot, 0 of 2. The one that he missed, oh my goodness, I don't know if you saw that, but it hit the other side of the backboard when he was at an angle. And I'm like, how do you, how do you shoot it so poorly, like from there? I don't, I don't know what happened, but I feel like the three point shot for Jalen Smith does not feel as good as it once did. So, and, and you talked about it in that Brooklyn game, he took some really early shots in the shot bad. clock. Yeah. No, no awareness of what's going on for feeling stuff like that. So sometimes, you know, Jalen Smith is, I feel like he was much, much better before the all-star break since the injury in, in the post all-star break, he's still been okay, but just not the same level as like, I don't know what consistency, I guess you can say for him. So I'm trying. I'm trying to give him the benefit of the doubt because I know that him spreading the floor is big. He's a pretty good rebounder. I think he ended up having six last night in 13 minutes. So it kind of shows how dominant he can be on the glass at times. But you know, Isaiah Jackson uh, being ready to come in, that's great. But some of the stuff Isaiah Jackson did with his fouls, <laughs> that's part of the reason he's not playing as much. And I think that was a good point to bring up, just because he had some really stupid fouls. If he missed a rebound and he just was trying to get his hand in there to try to get a jump ball, like he got one jump ball, but like you can't do that. Sometimes you just have to accept that the play is over. The other team got the advantage. Get back and play defense, and he doesn't always do that. So to me, that was one of those things where I was just like, okay, I, I noticed that about Isaiah. Just three fouls in just a short amount of time. He's got to be more disciplined. Yeah, that was more like old school I, Isaiah Jackson from from years past with the the fouls really hadn't been I feel like much of an issue this year which was you know great to not have to call out so much so I think that uh yeah that was evident one thing about Jalen Smith that I think does deserve a shout out is his aggressiveness to get to the free throw line in the first half I think that that was great he actually led the Pacers in free throw attempts <laughs> with seven attempts right and he only did it in about 13 minutes so I think that that was uh that was good to see and it's just it's just like funny because every now and then like if you see a clip from Jalen Smith pre this year you forget just how how much size he put on. So it's mm-hmm. just like, still, I know we highlighted that in the beginning of the year, but it's just something that you still want to give him credit because he's gotten just a lot more physical. I think at times he's also gotten, uh, you know, a little physically angry, like we talked about a couple nights ago, getting in with the uh, Schroeder. So I think that he's just become kind of like a man, and the Pacers need some of that physicality. So um, good to see but obviously, hey, you hope everything's all right. We you know with Zankel and look, he could, he could be good moving forward. The Pacers obviously need some Jalen Smith. But this was a, a performance that, yeah, it wasn't the best defensively for a while. The Thunder was shooting like, I think for the game, they shot about 49%. But I think at halftime, they were at like 56, 57%. And it was like, ugh. But the Pacers did a good job defending three point line. And I think that uh, this is one of those performances where I didn't care if you won by one, 10, whatever it may be, you needed to win. And it's exactly what the Pacers did. Handled business at home. They won the season series against the Thunder. This game a little bit different than the previous one, but it's a good Thunder team nonetheless. Even without maybe their their two top players, you still got a a good win that you needed to get. Yeah, water finds its level, right? You lose two to the Blazers, but you beat the Thunder twice, right? That makes sense. Basketball, baby. 
Mm-hmm. But last but last night, Friday night, was a big night for the Pacers because they got some help from some other teams. The Charlotte Hornets, behind Brandon Miller, his Wild. performance, they take down the Orlando Magic, went 124 to 115, and the Magic have had a pretty easy schedule the last third mm-hmm. of the season. So Take. that was a, a big uh, a big win there for the Hornets and for the Pacers. Then Chicago, you know, they're playing their butts off because they're trying to keep Atlanta from jumping them in ninth and getting that first home game in the play-in. They take care of the the Knicks, 108 to 100. So that was a big one. And then let's go down just a little bit. This doesn't really help that much, but it's just good to see the Bucks. They lose 117 to 111 to the Raptors. Now, here's the thing. The Pacers play the Raptors on Tuesday night. So this will be after their game against the Heat Sunday. The Raptors had previously lost 15 games in a row prior to their win against the Bucks. The Bucks have now lost three games in a row, Fachi. The Washington Wizards, the Memphis Grizzlies, and the Toronto Raptors. They have a winning percentage of 38%. So the Bucks, they seem to be kind of falling apart. And unfortunately, the Heat, they did pick up a 119-104 victory over the Rockets. And that game was a little close early on, but never really felt like it. So as the standings sit right now, the Pacers are just a half, one and a half games back of the four seed. But they only have a half game lead over the Miami Heat and only a one and a half game lead over Philadelphia. But they do have that tiebreaker, so it's actually more like two and a half. But still, just a, a lot of basketball still have to play in these final four games. This is intense. This is edge of the seat material because you talked about it. It's like the Pacers are actually within reach of the four seed, but they're also super close to being in the play. And it's like there is just no wiggle room in between. But yeah, last night was was wild to see the Hornets pull that upset. That is not something that I expected. The Bulls are a feisty team that have given the Pacers a ton of trouble this year. Um, the Bulls ironically play the Knicks two more times <laughs> this year. So playing the Knicks three times in the final like five or six games is crazy scheduling. But we'll see. Maybe maybe, maybe Chicago could give them some trouble. Orlando, yeah, that 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 schedule had been very easy. We'll see what happens. As you mentioned about the Bucks. The Bucks are now 15 and 16 with Doc Rivers. Yep. 15 and 16 with Doc Rivers. That's crazy. They might have made a big mistake. But now the stage is set. Pacers versus Heat. Everything is on the line. In my opinion, this is a playoff game. This is exactly what it feels like. It feels like you are hosting a playoff game. The winner is going to have that tiebreaker over over the, you know, Pacers will on the tiebreaker over the heat and it's it's going to be huge uh philly you know we'll see what happens I, I think that pacers have a little bit of wiggle room right now maybe b doesn't play back to backs I, I know they have that, that situation coming up but the winner of this game between the pacers and the heat controls their own destiny this is an opportunity where if the pacers win out they keep at least the sixth spot at minimum but it's gonna it's it ain't gonna be easy and when i look at the last two games that the Pacers played against the Heat. They only played three games this year instead of a four-game series. The first game, the Heat won 142 to 132. The second game, the Pacers won 144 to 129, but they have not faced each other since December 2nd. This is a very different Pacers team since the last time, and Tyler Hero is now back for the Miami Heat. He just made his return. So things are going to look a little bit different this time around. I bet it's going to be a lot less scoring in this game. I think it'll be closer nah, to like I'm a 108-104 finish type Maybe. thing. I feel like it's going to be pretty like a lot of nerves probably because of the mag- the magnitude of this game. I know people are trying to like hype yeah. it up and ask these players about it. TJ McConnell's like, we can't make it bigger than any other game we're playing. We have to just take it as like every single game. But Tony East really laid it out great on – Twitter with, with trying to explain what is at stake here for the Pacers and the Heat. So he said the winner ends the night in sixth place. The winner gets the Miami Indiana head to head tiebreaker. The the winner also gets the top spot in the Indiana Miami Philadelphia three way tiebreaker. And then like you mentioned, winner controls their own destiny for a postseason berth. So that is that is huge. It is a playoff game. I will say this. I mean, you could say there's a lot of big games that have happened this year for the Pacers because of their end season tournament run, but if you're looking at just regular season stuff, maybe outside of that Boston game in, in Gambridge Field, this might be the biggest game of the season just based on where things are where things are at. So I, I'm really interested to see how the fan base shows out for Sunday. 
I, I hope that this is a packed arena and that they kind of make it feel like a playoff atmosphere like it was uh, against Boston because that was an electric building. You could feel it through the TV, but if you were there in person, you couldn't even talk to the person next to you. That's how loud it got. So I think that fans really want to see this Pacer team do well. You need to get to the arena, except for Fachi, and, and cheer yeah, this team on. Not me. Not me. But look, this is a Heat team. They sh- struggle to score. They really do. Not in the two matchups that I mentioned before against the Pacers right. in the past, but this is a Heat team that struggles to score, but they still play really good defense. The Pacers actually average about 14 and a half more points per game than what the Heat give up on a nightly basis. So expect an uglier game. Can the Pacers win this game? Like you mentioned, they only have one win below, uh, I think, 111 points this year. So can they win that, you know, 110 to 105 type of matchup? I don't know. History this season says that they kind of can't. But I would love to see that uh, if they can do it once more because I I don't think this is going to be like the the previous matchup. So um, Pacers are going to have their hands full. The good news is they get up for this type of scenario. This is exactly what the Pacers come to play. I like the fact that the Pacers have, you know, a night off in between. They're still home. They're not traveling. Like, what excuse is there? I don't think you can make a single excuse well, the Pacers are a little bit tired or they're on the road. You can't. All excuses are out the door. It's time to take care of business. And I think that if you want to be taken seriously and feel that you could win in the playoffs, this is a perfect test against the Miami Heat. Yeah, and I will say this. Obi Toppin played such good defense against Jimmy Butler when they were in Miami. He did. I'm sure he won't get that assignment because he probably won't be starting but I'll be curious to see if maybe they go to that early knowing that they had success against it. Jimmy Butler is probably going to be in playoff Jimmy mode for this game. I think so. just feels like it. I'm not going to guarantee it, but I'm just saying this is what makes me the most nervous is just this team just went to the NBA finals. I know it's a little bit different of a, of a team, but their, their main pieces are still there. Yeah. So they know what it takes to get there. So I think that the Pacers just really have to come in and there's just not a lot of playoff experience on this Pacers team right now outside of Pascal Siakam, like TJ McConnell even said, I've never played a playoff game in Gambridge Fieldhouse. The only mm-hmm. time I've made the playoffs was when we were in the bubble. So that was really interesting to kind of hear him say that because really, if you think about it, the only players that have had playoff experience in here are Doug McDermott and Miles Turner. Yeah. So that, that that's crazy to me, and it's going to be a playoff-like environment. No, it really is. And when you look at those last two matchups against the Pacers, uh, I mean, against the Heat, it was actually the one that the Pacers won was when Tyrese Halliburton didn't play. Didn't play. Bruce Brown. And it was Bruce Burr. Brown. Yep. That ain't going to be there. I mean, so it's just like this is just a totally different team. I mean, Buddy Hill was in the starting lineup. Obi was in the starting lineup. Like you mentioned, the defense that he played, he gave you 20 points in that game. And then I just feel that the game that the Pacers lost to the Heat was when Halliburton scored 44 points. So – it's not the same Halliburton right now. I mean, this is a Halliburton that just scored eight points against OKC. So I don't know exactly what to expect from each player. All I know is that the stakes could not be higher. And with a win, there's there's just um, the Pacers' chances in the playoffs propel so much further, especially where the standings are. What could happen with you know Orlando and the Knicks, it's hard to even look that far. Because if you don't beat Miami, truly, none of that matters. Yeah, and I will say this too: you got to keep an eye on the, the the recent acquisition of the Miami Heat, and that's Terry Rozier. And mm-hmm. this season alone, Terry Rozier has averaged twenty three and a half points, seven and a half Three rebounds, year. and five assists against the Pacers. So that's going to be a tough matchup. I'm assuming that's who Andrew Nembhard will be guarding, and I'm assuming that Tyrese Halliburton will be chasing Duncan Robinson around. And then you've got Jimmy Butler, who I think will be guarded by Aaron Neesmith. And then you'll probably have Pascal Siakam on Jovic and then Miles on Bam. So, you know, it's not going to be easy. And I think Obi Toppin will probably have to match up pretty well with Kevin Love in the second unit. Caleb Martin's also been a big part of that second unit as well. You mentioned Tyler Hero. You know, he had 17 points in his return. Uh, Hawkeyes Jr. is is someone that really hurt the Pacers last time they played. Really did. Yeah, like he was really good. I know he's not been playing as well, but still, like you can't count him out. And then somebody that I'm going to just say right now that I think could be an X factor for them, 
that's Haywood Heisman. I, I've seen that guy hit so many random shots for this team, and he only had four points in the last game they just played against the Rockets. But he is somebody that if you don't pay attention, he is someone that could get going. So I don't know who's going to end up guarding him with the second unit more more likely. Uh, it'd probably be like Ben Shepard, maybe Doug McDermott if he's out there. But you can't allow him to kind of get free and get going because I've seen him hit big shots when the game's on the line, and it's just like – I don't want to see that happen. No, you, you don't. And uh, I, I just, man, this, there's so much on the line in this game. And, yeah, you are going to get playoff, Jimmy. And, and I'm looking at that last time uh, when, when the Heat, not the last time, but when the Heat beat the Pacers 142 to 132, it was a 13-point fourth quarter uh, advantage for Miami where they went and stole that game from behind. So yeah. you, you just, this is going to, feel like it ain't going to feel like a regular season game i'll tell you that there's going to be something extra and it's it's been so long since you know tj warren and the miami he and jimmy butler and all that with the bad blood there but like there's just something a little bit extra about playing the heat from those times in the past even though there's no lebron and bosh and wade but it's like we ran into those teams and then like i mentioned with jimmy and tj warren it's like the miami heat are a great measuring stick for a team that has that success in the playoffs and has been there. Jimmy, you know, and, and the Heat have now been to two of the last, you know, three or four NBA finals. You want to be for real, you got to take down the Miami Heat. And if you can do that, you know, I think this Pacers team is going to feel real good about themselves. But if they're to come up short against Miami, all of a sudden it's going to be an uphill battle and it's probably going to be really hard to get yourself out of playing territory. Yeah, they're going to need some help. I think the only thing that they could look at maybe for some help is if like New York or Orlando ends up falling and then Miami and Indiana kind of sneak into the 5-6 there, which could be a nice turn of events, but you can't bank on that. Obviously, yeah. you just want to control your own destiny here with just only a few games left. But if you look at Orlando's schedule, Fachi, it is not easy. They've got the Bucks twice. Mm -hmm. yep. So, you know, and I'm trying to think who else they play. I know they play the Rockets. I don't know if you have the schedule up or not, but – uh, I, I can pull they it up. They got the Bulls years. next. They got the Bulls on Sunday. I know that. Feisty. You know, you just can't count the Bulls out. We know too well how, how tough the Bulls are to beat. We but... overlooked them many times. So here is what Orlando has. They play Chicago, then three straight on the road against Houston, Milwaukee, and Philly. And then they wrap up against the Bucks, um at home. So there, there's actually a, a lot on the line. Chicago. five in a row. It's it, anything's possible because look, Philly, they need that game. I mean, yes, they'll be in the playing territory regardless, but we'll see how how things shake up. But you know, that could very well be a a, team, a time where Philly's going full force out there. And Milwaukee, I mean, they just slipped from the second seed down to the third. They they got stuff to play for. So I, I do think now? yes, yes, Cleveland moved uh, last night into the the two spot. Oh wow. Uh, okay. No, never mind. So I, I guess I guess it's still their game. The Cleveland's a game back. Cleveland's a game back. Yep. So, but that's there's, still there's, that's big. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's there's a lot to still play for. So, uh, we'll see what happens. I mean, it, it it's crazy right now. Uh, look, obviously the Pacers aren't going to catch you know Milwaukee or anything like that, or, or or even Cleveland for the third. But it's like when you're looking at this, there's two and a half games separates. You know, actually three games separates three through uh, seven right now. That's that's pretty wild. It is pretty wild. And that's why it's going to be a gauntlet this next week or so. So um, I think everyone's getting excited for playoff basketball. And this is kind of what the play-in is supposed to do. It's supposed to add uh, an added element to, to making more competitive games happen throughout the regular season because you want to avoid that win-or-go-home situation. So, you know, it has worked in terms of trying to make every game super important because at this point right now, everybody would say, well, we got our top eight teams locked in. Who cares? We'll rest everybody, get ready for the playoffs. Like, there's still a lot of playoff position, I guess you could say, in terms of, like, seeding-wise. But still, you wouldn't be in that fear mode of, like, oh, well, if we miss the playoffs, you know, this, this, or that's going to happen. So I, I definitely am just interested to see how this Pacers team shows up on, on Sunday. Which team's going to show up? Is a team that, you know, showed up against Boston and, and made it to Las Vegas going to show up? Or is a team that we saw against the Brooklyn Nets on Wednesday night going to show up? And I hope that we get the former, not the latter. Is it? It feels comical to say. Should I feel better that we're playing the Heat than we are playing Brooklyn or like Washington? Or that is Portland? comical. It's like it, it should not be something that you even debate. 
But it's like, hey, when the Pacers see a playoff team on the schedule or something like that, they do rise to the occasion. And I am expecting, and maybe that's the, my inner clown in me, I'm expecting the Pacers to come ready to rock, defend home court, and treat this like nothing short of a playoff game. If they have that mentality for the remaining four games of the year, I really do think that good things are going to happen. And uh, I'm hoping that loss to uh, Brooklyn was a good old kick in the butt to be able to say, hey, wake up, because well, right now you can't afford another loss or a letdown. Nothing would shock me less than the Pacers beating Miami and then losing to Toronto on Tuesday. I'm just going to put it, it out That would here. be maddening. It, it would be awful. It's been their MO all season. I know. But it's like, is it just me or the fact that maybe Toronto got one win? You think they're like, okay, all right, all right, all right. Like, you know, we, we got off the losing streak. This is a team that it, it looked like a pretty hard tank job. They need to fall, I believe, in at least the top six or seven. I think, they're, I think their pick is only – it's either top six or top seven protected. Otherwise, it goes to San Antonio. So I do think that they have a, a few reasons to lose. But at the same point, um, I'm happy that they got a win and they're not still on such a massive skid. Yeah, they have the the sixth worst record in the NBA, and the team closest to them is Portland with 21 wins. So they would need to have Portland win like three games, four games, and then lose out. So they're kind of stuck. And then and the next team closest to them win wise is Memphis at 27. So you know, I, they're they're top six right now. So I think they probably want to stay there. Yeah, but are they going to intentionally throw a game? I don't know, but they could play lesser talented players just to kind of try to get guys more experience and more development, like we've seen the Pacers do before. But overall, this is a game the Pacers have to mature. They cannot lose that game. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. But Fachi, this has been a lengthy episode that we've done today. So hope you guys enjoy this long Saturday into Sunday morning episode before the game on Sunday night. But go ahead and let everybody know where they can find us at on social media. Absolutely. So you can find us on Twitter at Pacers Pod STP. You can find Alex on Twitter at Alex Golden NBA. I can be found on Twitter at underscore F A C C I. You can find us on Instagram at Pacers Pod STP. You can find us on Facebook at Setting the Pace. You can find us on TikTok, Setting the Pace. And Alex, tell them where they can check us out on YouTube. Well, ladies and gentlemen, go to youtube.com slash setting the pace, a Pacers podcast where you can find all of our video content for our post game shows and occasional podcasts are on there as well. It just depends on how much time I have to edit and put them up there. But with that being said, everybody, the post-game shows will be up there for you to check out. So do make sure you subscribe, like the video, comment below, let us know what you think about our conversation and what you guys are seeing from this Pacers team. We want to hear your thoughts. We really do. We really care about what you guys have to say. So please give us some feedback there as we will respond to all those comments. And if you are a listener on the audio platform, once again, please leave that five-star rating and review wherever you get your podcast. That would be greatly appreciated with Faji. If you're hoping the Pacers can take care of business and control their own destiny by beating the Miami Heat on Sunday night, you know what to do. Hit me with those three words. Let's go Pacers!